Thank you very much, Chair, and Professor Bartolini. Um, I'm delighted to be here, um, very honored to be here to present in this very illustrious lecture series, uh, and also excited to have the opportunity to share the results of some of my recent work on electoral integrity and electoral malpractice. As Professor Bottini has suggested, I've been working on the topic of electoral integrity and electoral malpractice for a number of years now, on and off, with other projects on the go as well. Um, but for probably slightly over 12 years now, I've been studying electoral integrity. And my, the first question I was interested in looking at was what factors are associated with good quality elections and poor quality elections. So basically, what causes electoral malpractice and under what conditions um, we find that elections malfunction in some way, the flawed elections. More recently, I've turned my attention to what accounts for change in the quality of elections. And so some of the research I'm going to be sharing with you today is the work that I'm currently doing on what accounts for improvements in the quality of elections. And this is where the, the electoral tango goes in. And I hope I'll be able to um, convey to you the, the basic idea that I have that elections um, have to get bad before we, they get better. Or very often the pattern we see, to be a little bit more precise, we very often see a pattern where some major problem is associated with electoral conduct and that mobilizes citizens to press for improvements in the quality of elections and then that leads leaders under certain circumstances that I'll discuss to uh, decide that it's in their interest to hold better quality elections. So. To take you through this argument, oops, press the wrong button here. Which one is that I use just to make it go for this one? Oh, this one, okay. Can I just bring this a bit closer? Okay, firstly, I think it makes sense with a topic like this that may not be familiar to everyone, just to say a bit about what I mean when I talk about electoral integrity and electoral malpractice. Um, so a simple way of defining these terms is that electoral integrity uh, is basically conformity to democratic standards of electoral conduct, including inclusiveness, transparency, and impartiality. And these standards can be um, elaborated with respect to democratic political theory, as I've done. They also can be discussed in terms of international um, commitments, under, commitments under international law, which some other scholars have also done. Um, but electoral malpractice, the way I understand it, simply, it's very simply it's, it constitutes deviations from electoral integrity. So when there's a problem with electoral integrity, we talk of electoral malpractice. Now, there are some problems of electoral integrity that we wouldn't necessarily describe as malpractice. We might describe as mispractice, and these would be problems that result from simple mistakes or incompetence or lack of resources. So I'm not talking about elections are badly run, that perhaps aren't enough polling stations to accommodate the population because the state doesn't have resources to, to conduct elections that well. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about um, systematic deviations from the principles of inclusiveness, transparency, and impartiality. So electoral malpractice, therefore, um, is, has a political component to it. It's not simply um, maladministration. It's uh, actual intentional um, deviations from uh, democratic standards generally um, uh, for the purposes of manipulating elections. Electoral malpractice, the way I understand it, is broader than the, the concept of electoral fraud, which is a term that's very commonly used. And the reason I, I prefer the term electoral malpractice to electoral fraud is that um, there are certain types of manipulation that it's difficult to really describe as fraud. And one of these types of manipulation is manipulation of electoral rules, manipulation of electoral laws. Um, I think it would be really stretching the term fraud to describe manipulation of a law as, as, as fraudulent. But certainly this falls under the, the, the definition I've given you of electoral malpractice. And so that's the first type of electoral manipulation. And in um, 
some previous work I've done, this is actually the most common type of electoral malpractice, is manipulation of election rules. So this might be gerrymandering or the design of, of conditions under which people are allowed to stand for election in such a way as to systematically exclude certain types of people, um, the manipulation of electoral registers so as to make it very difficult for certain types of people to register themselves, or disenfranchisement of sectors of the population. So property requirements or uh, some type of rule which, which disenfranchises certain, certain ethnic groups or the um, blatant exclusion of certain categories of, of people from the, the franchise. Uh, so that's the most common type of electoral malpractice in the countries I've looked at. Manipulation of voters is um, uh, also another very common type of electoral malpractice and this involves the manipulation of uh, the preferences that are cast on voting day. And there are basically two different ways in which uh, leaders, political leaders, can manipulate voters. They can either manipulate their true preferences through manipulation of the media or through uh, slander of their opponents or through um, the obstruction of, of their opponents' electoral campaigns so that people only get information about you know, one political party or one set of candidates and not, not the others. Um, it can also involve the um, convincing preferences uh, to be falsified. So convincing voters to falsify their preferences, uh, either involving the carrots or sticks. So voters can be bought, they can be um, induced to cast a vote for a party or candidates other than their preferred one by being paid, or uh, they can be intimidated, harassed, uh, violence can be committed against them in order to convince them to uh, cast a, a vote for a uh, different um, party, different from their, from their genuine preference, or indeed they can be um, intimidated into not voting at all. Um, and the manipulation of voters in the era of election observation is actually quite attractive for a lot of leaders because a lot of election observers find it very difficult to monitor this type of thing, particularly vote buying where there may be collusion between the people who sell their votes and the people who buy their votes. And so it may be in the interest of all concern to hide this type of practice. But also the obstruction of, of campaigns and many types of intimidation is very difficult for monitors to, to track um, and so this is a very common type of uh, electoral manipulation and one that doesn't carry that much risk. I mean, the manipulation of electoral rules is, is really low risk to leaders who control the parliament. They can get the parliament to pass a particular law, provided it doesn't go too far beyond international standards. They won't get too much flack from international organizations. Um, but manipulation of voters is also a very convenient tool for a lot of leaders who want to make sure they win the election, but don't want to go, uh, come up against too much international objection. Now, manipulation of voting procedures is the t third type of electoral malpractice, and this is the one that's most commonly referred to when people use the word fraud. So this is uh, stuffing ballot boxes, falsifying the results by simply adding zeros or taking away zeros or changing the numbers, um, uh, perhaps uh, falsifying the electoral register, stuffing the electoral register, uh, other things that happen uh, as part of the, the, the voting process itself, the process of registering people to vote and casting votes and counting votes and announcing the results, tabulating the results. A manipulation of all of these aspects of the, the, the voting process is what we normally describe as electoral fraud. And this actually, in, in the work I've done, is, is proves to be the least common type of electoral malpractice. It's also the riskiest, which is maybe uh, one of the reasons why it's the least common, because election, observ election observation missions are designed to pick this type of thing up. Um, and, and so you, you, if, if you commit a lot of a manipulation of voting procedures, someone will probably find out and you get a negative um, report by international and domestic election observers. It's also, also risky for another reason I'll go into in more detail. It's the manipulation of voting procedures which is most likely to get people out into the streets. Uh, because this happens on the same day, most of it at least happens on the same day on voting day, and it's very visible. Um, it's, it's typically involves stealing people's votes, and people really don't like to have their votes stolen. So this is risky to, to, um, to leaders because it tends to lead to popular mobilization. 
Hi. Um, just to briefly review uh, what I found to be some of the factors that are most commonly associated with electoral malpractice, media bias is, is the factor that um, is um, general bias in the media, not just at election time. General bias in the media is, is the factor that I found to be um, the factor that, that best predicts electoral malpractice. You have free and fair media, you're likely to have better elections, freer elections. But also the strength of civil society, how well civil society is organized. And then I think linked to that is the extent to cor of corruption. Now you might say, well, civil society and corruption, they're not all part of the same thing. But in one sense, if you think of the way social organization works in a society. In a democratic society, the model of social organization being basically flat, and civil society organizations structure the space between the individual and the family on the one hand and the state on the other, and they are non-hierarchical um, organizations that operate mostly democratically in a sort of a, a network structure among civil society organizations. Whereas in states that are dominated by hierarchical social structures, informal institutions, patronage-based structures, that's, those are the types of social organizations that tend to be associated most with corruption. And so corruption flourishes in, in context we have patronage-based, clientelist-based uh, social structures. And so the, 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 there's, a, there's, I think, a relationship between civil society and corruption. It's um, basically how, how society is structured outside of, of politics is, is closely linked to the opportunities and the, and the benefits of uh, engaging in electoral malpractice. And then inequality, you have more, more electoral malpractice in states that have higher levels of inequality. So there's some basic aspects of the structure of society um, the way people are integrated into politics that um, make electoral malpractice more or less likely. So this is just a background to um, my argument about what um, tends to, to uh, be associated with improvements in the quality of elections. Um, there are a number of people that have suggested that electoral quality might improve because a regime fragments from within uh, and undertakes reform. This is an argument that draws on theories of, of democratization that link democratization to the internal fragmentation and um, problems within a regime. Other people have suggested that improvements in electoral um, quality come about due to international pressure, pressure by international organizations for states to uh, reform their electoral systems, to curb uh, fraud and other types of electoral malpractice. And then quite a lot of people have taken the approach that I'm taking in, in, in developing my argument, and that's that uh, electoral reforms come about due to popular pressure. It's pressure from below that leads leaders to um, to reform the uh, electoral systems. My argument um, really uh, draws together a number of <clears throat> these uh, components of, uh, the, uh, of um, a number of these different types of arguments that other people have advanced. So uh, this argument that I'm, that I'm developing uh, is, is in, in many respects quite, uh, quite simple. That uh, elections tend to get better because people demand better elections. That leaders don't reform uh, their elections simply because they are benevolent leaders, that they one day wake up and decide, oh, I've been engaging in fraud for all these years, but I think you know, this year I'll hold a clean election. Um, that we, we see, if you look around the world, you see very few cases of leaders simply deciding one day through something that happens within the regime or for whatever reasons that, that they just, just want to, to hold cleaner elections. Um, I mean, there are some, some instances of this. One instance of this that people don't tend to talk about very much when they talk about electoral integrity is the Soviet Union. Um, largely because the Soviet Union disintegrated soon after Gorbachev decided to uh, allow more competitive elections, so there wasn't very much to talk about. But it is the case that in the last elections that were held in the Soviet Union in 1989-1990, there was a lot more competition was allowed, and so the main um, way in which electoral malpractice had, had been undertaken in the Soviet Union was through the manipulation of electoral law and, and um, the article in the Constitution that uh, forbade alternative political parties from competing in elections effectively. Well, that was, um, that stipulation was re relaxed and um, multiple candidacies were allowed and subsequently multiple parties were allowed to compete. Uh, elections started to, to improve. Uh, and that, I mean, th there was uh, the mobilization in favor of those, those changes in the Soviet Union really came from within the regime uh, up until Gorbachev um, started to 
uh, undertake reforms within the, the, the Communist Party, that there weren't a lot of people mobilizing on, on the streets. The mobilizations on the streets happened after the regime itself decided to, uh, almost all cases happened after the regime itself decided to, to liberalize. Um, so so I mean, there are examples of uh, reform to electoral institutions coming, coming about due to changes within the regime, but they're rare. Most uh, in, increases and in, uh, improvements in the quality of elections come about, at least in part, due to people um, mobilizing to demand uh, improved elections. However, most mobilizations, people on the street, um, in civil society, to demand better elections don't work. It's rare actually, the popular mobilization leads to an improvement in electoral quality. And so what I'm interested in looking at is the circumstances under which popular protest against poor quality elections leads to an improvement in electoral quality. So when do protests work, basically? And the argument that I'd um, like to present to you is that what happens in an election, sort of the internal dynamics of election, what happens after an election, is important in influencing the next election. Okay, um, so an election that is highly um, fraught with protest, allegations of fraud, um, an election also in which there's some indication that the leadership um, is weakening and unable to control the electoral results. Uh, it, it, that, that's the type of election that makes leaders think, makes leaders think twice about what they're doing. And it's under those circumstances that you're likely to see an improvement, but not usually um, an immediate improvement, it's usually an improvement in, in the subsequent election. So that's what um, I mean by the electoral tango, that there has to be serious problems. Electorals have to go one step back uh, before they go forward. Now, to develop this, this argument, I'd like to step, take a few steps back, back in, in time, and um, just point out a couple of things about how electoral malpractice works in the contemporary world and how that's different from the way it used to work. Because I think we, the types of ways in which leaders fiddle elections in the contemporary world are somewhat different from the way they used to fiddle elections. And that is because we've experienced a number of waves of electoral reform. Now, you're probably all familiar with um, Huntington's three waves of democratization. So I'm uh, inspired by that. I'm presenting you three waves of electoral reform, but they don't coincide exactly with the three waves of democratization. The first wave of electoral reform that I'm sure we're all um, familiar with is involves the, uh, the inclusion of the citizenry. So, franchise expansion, the inclusion of the citizenry um, in the franchise that took place um, well, started probably roughly around the 18th century and went up into the early 20th century. So this is the, the big battles over electoral reform, especially in the 19th century and the early 20th century, they were all about who got to vote. So property uh, franchise restrictions were uh, initially removed and then women were allowed to vote. All kinds of categories of people who hadn't previously been allowed to vote were allowed to vote. And this was the terrain on which the big battles over electoral reform were fought. It was about who, who could vote, so the inclusion of the citizenry. The second wave of electoral reform, I think it's possible to distinguish, involves the inclusion also, but it was the inclusion of political parties. So opening up of the, part of the party systems um, to multi-party competition. Um, and in, in many states in this, around the mid 20th century, those, the, the political parties either weren't, weren't allowed at all or there was only one political party. But now we look around the world today and we see that almost all countries hold elections and almost all, with some exceptions, almost all countries allow multi-party competition. That, that really wasn't the case about you know, 30, 40 years ago. And so we saw over the course of the 20th century a gradual inclusion of political parties in electoral competition that followed on from the inclusion of, of the citizenry that happened in earlier generation. And Professor Bartolini's work talks, um, talks about these two processes. Um, 
The third wave that I'd like to identify, the third wave of electoral reform, is the one that we're sort of in at the moment, and that um, involves the establishment of a level playing field for electoral competition, because the people having campaigned to have the franchise extended, got the franchise, were able to vote, they realized that they still weren't able to necessarily elect people to power who they wanted to lead them because there were restrictions on who was allowed to stand. And then gradually over the course of the 20th century, those restrictions were removed and um, we had more and more cases where states allowed multi-party competition, universal franchise, you say, well, fine, what's the problem? You know, you've got your inclusion, everyone can stand, everyone can do it, we've got democracy. Um, and so all those things that people had campaigned for, for, for all those hundreds of years, were delivered to them, but they found that there they still, they still were problems with the elections. The elections still weren't free and fair because states were finding, leaders were finding ways to um, give an advantage in the electoral process to some candidates and some political parties over others. So when people campaign in today's world for electoral reform, more likely than not, they're campaigning for a level playing field, for everyone to have an equal opportunity in practice to compete for um, in, in elections. Um, and so the types of things that people are demanding, when people mobilize on the street and have a protest, the types of things they're demanding are rather different today from the types of things they were demanding a generation or two or three generations ago. They're not demanding rights so much anymore in the sense of, you know, we want the right to, to stand, we want the right to vote. The demand, the, 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 the claims are more, the demands are more about the implementation of those rights. They've got the formal rights, and now it's just a, a matter of, of the extent to which those rights are realized in practice. Um, and I think this has significant consequences for protests in favor of, of uh, improvements in election quality because it means that there's been a, a gradual shift in elections from excluding people and political parties, sets of voters from elections, to biasing elections as a means of manipulating them. And this means that people are reacting to electoral manipulation in different ways. If you are a member of a group that does not have a franchise, you can't compete in elections. When there's an election, you might not necessarily pay that much attention because it's not your affair, it doesn't involve you. It's just a, a political process that involves elites, people outside, it's outside of your, your um, uh, the types of things you're necessarily interested in. Or if there's a, a one-party state that holds elections, again, you might not be very interested. It might not be a big deal. Um, you know, it's possible you might go out and vote because if you don't vote there might be some penalty um, but the electoral process in a one party state isn't really that m a meaningful political event, it's a ritual and so again, when the election happens you trudge along to the polling station, cast your vote and then you go home and you don't think about it All right? so it's not going to really anger you that much you might occasionally stop to wonder why there's only one candidate on the ballot but you know you're not necessarily going to get more aggrieved about this fact on election day than you know before or after elections. <clears throat> Whereas if you have been granted the franchise, and if there are multiple parties on the ballot, then you've got the formal rights. And every time there's an election, but those formal rights aren't implemented in a fair way, then your vote's stolen. All right? So something's been given to you, and it's been taken away. When people are something given to them and then it's taken away episodically, they get angry. Right? People don't like to have something taken away from them that's been granted formally. So when rights are episodically abused, people episodically get angry. And when a whole lot of people get angry at the same time, on the same day perhaps, such as election day or the day after elections and the results are announced, this creates the condition for mobilization. Right? Because everyone is angry for the same reason at the same time. And they're angry because they feel that something's been taken away from them. Their, their, their rights haven't been respected. Their, their rights haven't been uh, honored. And I mean, this is one of the different circumstance from the circumstance that we had previously. A lot of people just didn't necessarily have that much of an interest in paying attention to elections because elections didn't necessarily concern them or they weren't a meaningful political events. And so this would suggest that 
more, there's more popular mobilization against electoral malpractice in today's world, since uh, roughly the end of the Cold War, there's a dramatic increase in the number of states holding multi-party elections, than in previous generations. So it would suggest that popular mobilization against electoral malpractice is increasing. It's becoming a more politically significant phenomenon. And indeed, this is what we see. Um, I've taken data in these graphs from the NELDA data set, some of you may be familiar with. It's uh, national elections across uh, autocracies and democracies, uh, democracies and autocracies, uh, a data set uh, released several years ago by Susan High and Nikolai Marinov and has a variable that documents elections, full, uh, protests following elections, and then it's, able, it's possible to code those protests according to whether they're a protest against uh, electoral fraud or not. And so I've created a, a, a variable out of this data set that is an indicator of post-electoral protest against fraud. And the graph on the left is simply charts the, the number of, the absolute number of protests that occurred starting with the data set started in the, the 1970s up until close to the, the present day. And you can see there's been an increase. But you might say, well, there's been an increase in, in, in the overall number of countries in the world. And there's also been an increase in the proportion of all the countries that hold elections. And so you would expect to see an increase in protests for that reason. And so the graph on the right documents the proportion of all elections that were followed by uh, a protest against fraud. And you can see here that there is a quite dramatic increase in the proportion of elections elections that were contested through protest between the 1970s and the late 1990s, and then since then, um, the number of protesters sort of bumped around. It's not obviously going up or down. So um, as I suggested, in recent years have seen a dramatic increase in the number of states that for grant formal electoral rights to citizens, but then abuse them in practice. So rather than excluding people from the electoral process, states more often are including them, uh, but then failing to implement um, uh, rights uh, fairly. And this is, we can see, um, not surprisingly, people are more often getting angry and getting out in the streets and protesting following um, elections in which fraud has been committed. And so this um, provides some evidence that, that post-electoral mobilization against fraud is um, more common than, than it used to be. So it's a, a more significant um, political phenomenon. And the question that arises as well, um, does it really does it really make any difference, and under what circumstances does it make any difference? Does it does it in, in, improve? Uh, does it re increase uh, the chances that leaders will um, improve the quality of the election? And I think to understand the circumstances under which post-electoral protests are successful in achieving their end, we have to stop and think about the risks associated with elections, and also about the information that elections communicate. We have to think about risks and information with respect to both the leadership um, and the um, population at large, citizenry. So in uh, a state that holds uh, problematic elections, so this is an electoral authoritarian state, um, there's a, a considerable um, asymmetry in both risks and information conveyed by the elections. But elections um, are more risky for the regime than they are for the opposition because the regime uh, loses. If they lose the election, then they lose power. If they've been in power for a very long time, so often is the case in authoritarian regimes, there's a lot at stake uh, in elections. The opposition is usually used to losing elections. So if it loses another election, it's not necessarily going to perceive this as being uh, that much of an additional loss. Um, there's, there's an additional reason why losing elections um, is more costly in many authoritarian states, is that many authoritarian states have high levels of patronage um, and high levels of corruption, which means that the regime controls not just political power, but usually a substantial amount of economic power. And so when leaders lose elections, they very often lose economic resources, and their allies, their friends, their associates also lose economic resources, perhaps even their entire group, it could be a religious group, an ethnic group, loses economic resources. So there tends to be more at stake 
an economic perspective in elections than authoritarian states in the dozen democratic states. A third reason why leaders of authoritarian states really don't want to lose elections in many contexts is that often they don't really have the option of simply going into retirement. If they lose power, they often face uh, backlash from the, the judiciary. They very often a risk being put in jail for the things they did as an authoritarian leader or being exiled or perhaps even killed. And so losing power can, can be a very, um, can lead to a very negative outcome for many authoritarian leaders. So the stakes for them personally may be quite high in addition to the stakes for uh, their, their associates, their political party, uh, their, their ethnic group or other group that they're associated with. Um, and so losing, they, they can lose a lot if they lose an election. So the risks of holding a competitive election are fairly high for the authoritarian leader, unless the leader can, can control what's going on. The risks are less high for the opposition. So there's a risk asymmetry. There's also an information asymmetry. You think, well, if the risk of holding a competitive election is so high for, for the authoritarian leaders, why would they do it? And one of the reasons they do it, this is something that's been identified by another number of people, is that elections provide them with information. Authoritarian leaders um, face a significant challenge in getting accurate information about many aspects of the society they govern. And one of the challenges, the information challenges they face, is getting accurate information on how much support they have, how much genuine support they have in the sense that people who really like them, and also how many people are prepared to acquiesce to being ruled by them. Um, and what proportion of the population really wants change and no longer uh, wants to put up with being ruled by, by the current leadership. And it's important for authoritarian leaders to get this information because if they don't obtain information about possible opposition movements that are forming, if they overestimate their level of genuine support in the population, this can, be, um, this can lead to a disorderly exit from power, it could lead to a coup, it could lead to some violent overthrow, some popular uprising. So it's important for leaders to monitor what people are thinking, where pockets of opposition are, who's fomenting some kind of opposition movement. Um, they need to know this information so they can protect themselves, and sometimes protecting themselves involves making payments to people, transfers of, of resources to people to keep people happy. Perhaps they tax people too much or the economy is doing badly and so people are unhappy. They need to know how unhappy people they are so they can know how, 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 how many resources to hand over to people to keep them uh, more or less quiescent. And so elections provide quite good information about um, many aspects of, of popular support that people, are, that leaders are interested in in authoritarian states. They provide an overall general idea of, of, of how many people, um, what proportion of the population is prepared to go out on voting day and, and, and vote for them, so how much support they have. But they also enable people to identify um, regional uh, disparities in their support. So which, which areas of the country are going against them? Which areas of the country support them? Where does their support base lie? Also, the performance of individual um, regime members in an election provides some indication of who the popular members of the regime are and who's really unpopular. Um, and it provides some indication of how competent different members of the regime are in delivering a, an election result. So it provides the, the leader, leadership with indication on um, the performance of, of members and the loyalty of members of the regime itself and also the population and the opposition. So elections provide a lot of information to leaders. Um, however, if, the, if, if leaders um, simply release all this information to the general public, all the information that they get, then the, the opposition have the same, same information. So this is really not ideal. Fortunately for leaders, they have a way of obscuring some of this information from the opposition. And this comes about as, as a result of the fact that the, the election result that's reported after the election happened is a combination of two different Things. It's a combination of the leader's true support and also the amount of fraud they've committed. Um, different types of electoral malpractice. I and mean, the manipulation of electoral laws is, is available for everyone to know. So when we're talking here really about um, fraud, the manipulation of the voters and the manipulation of voting. And most types of fraud are committed um, by the regime, or at least the regime has the, the best um, ability to commit most types of, of fraud. They have the resources, they, they control the electoral process, they, they often have the resources they can distribute to voters through vote buying, they have control over the police and, and the military that can harass voters, so they have the, they, they're usually the ones who commit most fraud. And 
The electoral result is therefore a combination of, of their genuine support and the amount of fraud they, they commit. Um, but the, only the regime knows the amount of fraud that they commit. So only the regime is able to deduce from the reported electoral result, from the published electoral result, the, the true support of the regime. Because the opposition can't accurately measure the amount of fraud that's being committed. They probably, in most cases, have some idea that fraud is being committed. Um, they, they know the types of fraud that's being committed, but they don't have a very good sense of exactly how much was committed and where. And so it's very difficult for them to deduce the true support of the regime from the reported election result. But the regime can do this because they know, they know what they've done. They know the fraud they've committed. And so this leads to an information asymmetry. The, the reported election results reveals more information to the regime than it does to the opposition. And this gives an advantage to the regime. So although the regime um, is at a disadvantage in, in, in the risk asymmetry, in the sense that the, the election is more risky for them than it is for the opposition, they have an advantage to the information asymmetry. The, the election reveals more information to them than it does to the opposition. And so, therefore, provided the regime can deploy fraud strategically, in sufficient quantities to generate the election result they want, provided they can have a fair degree of certainty that they can decide they want 60%, they get 60% through a combination of genuine support and fraud, they have an incentive to hold an election. Um, so if they can manage risk, it makes sense for them to hold an election so that they can get information about the population and about um, the internal workings of their own regime, the competence and loyalty of their own members. So. Elections are, are very useful for regimes for this reason. However, sometimes things go wrong. And they go wrong when the information asymmetry uh, inherent in electoral process in an authoritarian state is um, reduced. And that information asymmetry can be reduced, or typically is reduced through a combination of factors. Firstly, the regime mismanages risk, um, and it, the electoral result indicates a decline in support for the regime. So the published result was less than what the regime expected, either because, um, usually because their, their genuine support is, has gone, sometimes because they are incompetent in their use of fraud, but this is less likely. Um, then this provides the opposition with information, really valuable information, the information that the regime is losing its grip. It's losing its ability to deliver the election result that it wants. Its genuine support is falling and or its ability to undertake the fraud that's necessary for its survival is falling. Either way, this is really, really useful information for the opposition because it reveals that the opposition has the potential uh, to gain on the regime and the regime is weakening. Um, this decline can very often provide an opportunity for the, the opposition to mobilize and undertake some kind of protest after the election. Assuming there is still a certain amount of fraud, they have an incentive to do that. And if this mobilization is successful, um, then this success provides additional information to both the regime and the opposition about information about the support of the opposition. How many people the opposition can gather onto the street? How strong they are? How loyal people are? How long they're prepared to stay there on the street? How successful the regime in, is in potentially repressing the opposition? So if the election reveals a decline in support for the regime and the, ele and the opposition mobilizes, then the opposition then has much more information about the relative support for the opposition and the regime than it did previously. And there's, a, and there's information asymmetry that enabled um, the regime to, you know, to successfully um, uh, deploy elections as an information collection device is, is, is reduced. And they're no longer, therefore, at such an advantage when it comes to elections. So then they're in a, oops, I pressed the wrong button here. Then they're in a, how do I get out of here? Um, then they're in a bad situation. And this situation can, can play itself out in three different ways. Firstly, the regime can simply repress the opposition, undertake um, measures to um, initiate reforms that actually reduce the quality of elections, um, perhaps clamp down on the media, clamp down on civil society, deprive people of their rights, reform the electoral laws in such a way as people don't have such an opportunity to compete at the subsequent election. So repression is, is always an option for uh, the regime. 
if it can be undertaken successfully. However, there are two other possible outcomes. Firstly, there can be a popular um, revolt following an election so that the mobilization against electoral fraud can lead to some immediate challenge to the, that election result, the election that was just held, and this can lead to the downfall of the leader. So, so the Orange Revolution in Ukraine was an example uh, of this happening when the um, the election had to be reheld, and, and um, there was a different result for the, the reholding of the election. And in some cases, this can have significant negative consequences for the leader. Um, not in the Ukrainian case, but it can lead to um, imprisonment, death, exile. So, a disorderly exit for power is from power is something that the leader is, is a definite possibility for a fraudulent election, especially when um, the opposition has demonstrated its ability to, to mobilise popular support and when the, the, uh, the regime is weakening. And this is something that the leaders really, really don't want. Because a leader, more than wanting to be in power or have a lot of money, a leader wants to remain alive. Um, and so the prospect of this happening is something that a leader is definitely going to fear. A third possible outcome is that the, the, the regime is able to um, weather any type of popular protest, so the protest fizzles out, um, but then the leader thinks twice about what might happen at the next election and fears some kind of disorderly exit from power, fears not being able to repress an opposition that takes place following the following election, and um, decides to uh, make concessions to uh, the demands of the population of the opposition and to improve the quality of elections, hold free and fair elections, and either exit power um, through peacefully negotiate some type of exit power into retirement or simply uh, be willing to lose the election in the hopes of them being able to win the election subsequently. So most people who have looked at the dynamics between um, protesters who protest against electoral fraud and the regime have only really considered the first two options. You know, the regime either repress or the regime um, fails to repress and is toppled. But actually, um, statistically, the third uh, option is, 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 is the most common, that the regimes just weather a protest, and the protest just fizzles out, and then they have to decide what to do next time. Um, and so my argument is basically that in, in a large number of cases, um, when the regime is weak, we see either the second or the third um, outcome. Uh, if the regime recognizes from the election results that um, it's losing strength and the opposition is able to mobilize protests successfully, then it's uh, either it would be toppled, or again, this isn't that common, or it will think again for um, before the next election and it will um, decide that it wants to hold fair elections next time. Now, you might say, well, you know, a regime weakening, um, popular um, protests happening, it's all kind of part of the same thing. It's not two separate factors. Um, but of course, if the opposition sees that it's an, an advantage, the regime is weakening, they're going to they're wrap up their, their opposition, they're going to wrap up their protests. Um, uh, however, um, they don't necessarily have an incentive to ramp up protests if the regime doesn't exhibit some type of um, uh, sign of weakness, because this is a relatively uh, this is a relatively risky strategy. Uh, declining um, uh, declining uh, support. Um, can be a catalyst to organizing protests, but it's not necessarily going to be a catalyst for organizing protests. However, it's probably the case that declining support is not going to lead to any type of major reform in the absence of protest. Um, now, protests very often happen without there being any kind of decline in support, but um, according to the argument I'm developing, it's probably not the case that protest alone is likely to give leaders an incentive to reform elections. So neither declining support or protest alone um, is likely likely to, to create the circumstances under which reforms will take place. So it's the combination that's likely to be uh, the perfect scenario for leaders voluntarily um, improving the quality of elections. And this is actually not a very common occurrence. This, um, this again, using the NELDA data set, I've calculated um, using a, a variable on that data set as to whether the election resulted in uh, a gain for the opposition. Um, uh, 
the proportion of elections that were um, held in uh, authoritarian states defined as a, a state with a poverty score below six, the proportion of elections where you saw a combination of uh, a gain from the opposition and then a protest for in the election, it's only 3.4 percent, so it's not, it's not that common. Most uh, elections where there's a gain for the opposition are not followed by protest. In some cases, obviously, the opposition wins the elections, though it doesn't get out onto the street. Um, but also, in most um, protests that do take place, so are not the, are, are, aren't um, following elections in which the, the opposition gains. So this is a, it's a very specific combination of factors. But I'm arguing that it's the specific combination of factors that provides the circumstances that are most likely to lead to uh, an improvement in, in election quality. And, and so I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about here. Um, Mexico is one example. Uh, an example of where the regime sort of thought again after it had a pretty high uh, election. Um, the, the revolution Institute, Institutional Revolutionary Party in, in Mexico um, maintained a hegemonic position for a very long time, um, nearly seven decades. However, um, when the regime were liberalized economically in the 1990s, no longer had so much, um, so many resources to distribute through its clientless networks that um, were largely instrumental in maintaining its support base. So this technique of buying voters off through um, the distribution of support um, vote buying was no longer so successful. Uh, and also a lot more people um, as Mexico developed, a lot more people were gaining sufficient amounts of economic resources. They didn't necessarily need to rely so much on state clientelism anymore. They had enough of their own resources through whatever they were doing in their in their job that they they, they could afford to, to vote for whoever they wanted. They didn't necessarily have to worry so much about um, gaining the, um, the support of the state. And so this combination meant that the sort of the political party machine that had kept the pre in power for so many years started to not perform so well. And so in order to stay in power, the priests started to have, have to have to use fraud. They started to, to have, use this risky form of manipulation of the voting procedures to, to stay in power. And in the, um, the 1988 election, they, um, things were going really badly for them, and they had, to, they had to steal the election on election night itself. The results started coming in. They saw, they saw the pre was losing, and they had to en engineer a power cut and then suddenly change the results, turn the power back on, and lo and behold, all of a sudden, the, the regime had you know, many more, more um, votes than they'd previously been reported. And this was really blatant. I mean, people just, they knew what had happened. It was clear. It was really risky. And actually, the, the guy who was in charge of doing this subsequently admitted he had done it in his memoirs. So we, we, you know, this is documented evidence we have that this happened. And people were really angry and they got out, out, out to the streets I mean, they had been mobilizing following elections for a long time in Mexico but these, these mobilization was, was major and people were really unhappy and it was clear that, that it would be very difficult for the pre to repeat this to under, uh, undertake such um, blatant fraud at subsequent elections and especially given that it probably would have had to undertake even more fraud in subsequent elections because its support was clearly declining um, and they anticipate that its support would have declined even, even further at the next election. So they were in a, in a bad position. And so this is an example of where the regime sees that it's in a weak position and decides to take some preemptive, make some preemptive moves to improve the quality of elections with the chance of potentially then being able to come back and win elections subsequently under free and fair circumstances. And so there are a number of electoral reforms in the 1990s that improved the quality of the Mexican elections, and Mexican elections now get a pretty good rating from people who observe them, and the PRI has indeed managed to, to win some of the fair elections. And so this is an example where there's a combination of declining support um, and popular protest put, um, gave the, the, the ruling party an incentive to uh, voluntarily improve the quality of the elections and a preemptive move to prevent being um, a disorderly exit from power. Another example is Serbia um, under Milosevic. Milosevic ran Yugoslavia and within Yugoslavia, Serbia um, for quite a number of years in the 1990s. But over the course of the 1990s, he, his, uh, the electoral result in the favor of his party and for him personally declined gradually. 
Um, and so he was using electoral manipulation, but he, the manipulation wasn't sufficient to keep the election results up. And he had a gradual decline. And things got really difficult for, for Milosevic after the NATO invasion of, of Kosovo because it, he had lost a, a military um, adventure. And losing a military adventure is really not a good thing for an authoritarian leader. I mean, this is what brought down the <clears throat> military government in Argentina in 1982 and the, the generals in, in Greece in 1974. I mean, defeat in, in war is costs authoritarian leaders dearly. And so things were not looking too good for him at the time of the 2000 uh, elections. At the same time, there was a lot of civil society effort to mobilize popular protest against elections. The civil society organizations had been doing this for several elections. They were getting some support from um, international uh, groups, in particular the United States, to teach them how to mobilize um, post-electoral protests, how to monitor elections, and so forth. And they were getting more skilled at this. Uh, and they had had a number of sort of trial runs where they had um, managed to get quite a lot of people onto the streets in previous elections. Um, and so the 2000 elections, uh, the results started coming in, again, like, like in Mexico, the results started coming in. They were looking bad for the regime. There's clearly been decline in their support. Uh, but they tried to manipulate the results on election night, but the opposition, people mobilizing on the streets were also doing parallel vote tabulation, so counting the results that were coming out in polling stations and adding them up, and they found that the uncovered uh, fraud and falsification of the electoral results at national level, and um, publicized these findings, and um, the demonstrations were sufficient in the context of declining real support that Milosevic basically had to, had to stand down and suffered this disorderly exit from power that authoritarian leaders tend to really fear. So this is through these two different examples of the different ways in which the situation can play itself out. And in the Serbian case, um, of course, there was an increase in improvement in the quality of the, the elections next time around because there was another, um, another group of people came into power and they're more democratic, they uh, held better quality of elections. So there's three di two different pathways through which a combination of weakening um, of the regime's genuine support and popular protest can lead to an improvement uh, in the quality of elections the next time round. Um, so to sort of test whether this, is, this, um, this seems to be taking place um, more widely, I've done some cross-national quantitative analysis, drawing again on the, the NELDA data set, um, and other correlates, I'm not going through all the, I won't go talk about all my control variables and all that, I won't even show you a regression model. Um, but the dependent variable is electoral uh, misconduct or electoral malpractice, and the model includes crucially um, whether there were protests against electoral fraud following the previous election and whether it was the, weak the weakening of the, the leadership relative to the opposition at the previous election. So these, these two key variables that are linked to the previous election, and also the interaction between them, because as I, su as I suggested, protests alone usually don't lead to reform. A decline in support for the, the regime relative to the opposition usually alone doesn't lead to reform. It's the combination of these two things that leads to an improvement in the quality of elections next time around. Um, and so that's the, the marginal effects of um, there having been a protest um, against electoral fraud following the previous election. And as you can see from the left-hand side of this graph, if there was a protest, but the election hadn't represented um, uh, again for the opposition, um, then you actually have uh, a figure that's above zero on this graph. And so this is, again, as I said, um, the dependent variable here is uh, an increase in electoral malpractice. So a higher um, score means more electoral malpractice. So if you just had protests alone and there hadn't been um, a decline of regime support at that election, in the next election there actually be an increase in electoral malpractice. However, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of the graph, um, if there had been um, an increase in support for the opposition at the previous election and there had been a protest um, for in that election, you have a decline in um, electoral malpractice at the subsequent election. So this supports the argument that there is this, this, this combination of two things that lead to um, an improvement in the quality of elections. So when... Uh, Leaders are weakening and people go out under the street. That's the sort of magic um, set of circumstances in which there's likely to be an improvement in the quality of elections next time around, bearing in mind that it's not very common. So 
then do the question that's been talked about a lot in the literature on authoritarianism recently do elections help or hinder authoritarian uh, regimes and the, the evidence I presented in my electoral tango argument suggests that they do both uh, uh, authoritarian leaders often benefit quite a lot from elections elections help them gather information however under specific circumstances they, they can um, suffer from uh, elections and elections may backfire um, and this is very specific circumstances in, in which elections um, in which their support is weakening and they have to deploy quite risky types of, of fraud um, but this also, I think this argument has a number of um, implications for electoral assistance providers. They're just throwing money at civil society organizations and helping them mobilize against fraud. It's not necessarily going to be a very good use of money. And a lot of their money that is going to be wasted because it's going to be given to groups in context where the regime is quite strong and the protests aren't going to make any difference. So it's when leaders' support declines, it's under those circumstances that electoral assistance and support of civil society and the opposition is most likely to be useful. So this Hopefully, um, my, this findings of this, uh, of this argument might be useful for electoral assistance providers. And also for people who might be considering getting out in the street and, and protest. I mean, once you go out in the street and protest, well, it doesn't really make sense, uh, according to this evidence, to go out in the, on the street and protest unless the regime is already showing some signs of weakening, because otherwise you're just wasting your time and perhaps getting thrown in jail. So there's a, there's a specific set of circumstances when it makes sense to, uh, to protest. But unfortunately, most of the time, it's probably not going to help very much. So that's the argument. And um, I'd very much like to hear your, your comments and questions. Thank you very much.